Hi, my name's Rachel, and I've done this intro, f intro, 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 like four f***ing times. Hi, my name's Rachel, and today we're talking about another Did It Deserve One Star. This is a series I do here where if a book gets one star and maps on Goodreads, I read it and review it and tell you if it deserved all of those one stars from a craft standpoint. Typically this happens because of something an author says or does and today's book is The Ones We Burn by Rebecca Mix. If you're not familiar with the discourse that led to this uh, being one star in mass on Goodreads, I have a... <laughs> I am predisposed to rambling so I'm just gonna link you down below if you're interested to hear the discourse summed up really quickly and much more intelligently than I could do. Mari from My Name is Marinez has two TikToks. I recommend watching both of them. They're quick and she's a lot smarter than I am and I feel like she puts it together better than I could and I just there was a lot to it but she summed it up very quickly and I feel like that is your best bet rather than me rambling for the next seven to nine minutes about what happened. Before I start though I do actually want to say two quick things about all the discourse. Um, I want to reiterate something I said in my video about Alex Astor. I am really uncomfortable with the way that people are talking about and to Chloe Gong. I think it's just, why is everything going off at once? I think it's just really inappropriate to tell Chloe Gong to choke for blurbing a book. Uh, that's just not appropriate. And the second thing I wanna say is that the fact that the original anonymous review that started all this discourse was made by someone who it seemed to me was trying to just do the right thing and talk about how they perceived the book. The fact that they felt like they needed to post it anonymously and say that they needed to post it anonymously because that they were afraid of backlash is really telling of how vitriolic this online community of book reading and reviewing can be and that is deeply disturbing to me. The fact that they were worried about backlash to that degree really shows how unsafe a community about books can actually be for some people and we as the people in it on an individual level have quite a lot of work to do. That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, for the review I'm just going to give you my thoughts on the book, why I gave it two stars, and tell you about what I uh, observed happening in the book and why I think that this was just not good, poorly done in any capacity. Uh, yeah, let's just get into it. First I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Potato Starch Marxist patrons, Molly, Reba, Allison, Ebby, Carlin, Shannon, Paige, Sean, and Kate. Thank you all so much. I appreciate you. You're the best. If you're interested in subscribing to my Patreon, you get early access to videos and some other small perks, I guess. I don't know. I don't know how to plug my own Patreon anymore. I forget. If you think this shit show is worth supporting, it's down below. <laughs> Here's the synopsis of the book. Renka is tired of death. All she wants to do now is be left alone, living out her days in Witchick's Wild North with the coven that raised her, attempting to forget the horrors of her past. But when she is named Bloodwind, the next treaty bride to the human kingdom of Isodal, her coven sends her south with a single directive, kill him. Easy enough for a blood witch whose magic compels her to kill. Except the prince is gentle, kind, and terrified of her. He doesn't want to marry Renka. He doesn't want to be king at all. And it's his sister, the wickedly smart, infuriatingly beautiful, beautiful princess Aramis, who seems to be the real threat. But when witches start turning up dead, murdered by a mysterious magical plague, Aramis makes Renka an offer. Help her develop a cure, and in return, she'll help Renka learn to contain her deadly magic. As the coup draws closer, wait, nearer, sorry, and the plague spreads, Renka is forced to question everything she thought she knew about her power, her past, and who she's meant to fight for. Soon she will have to decide between the coven that raised her and the princess who sees beyond the monster they shaped her to be. But as the bodies pile up, a monster may be exactly what they need. Here's the thing, the synopsis gave shush literally the entire book away the entire book and because of that i was able to predict every single step of this book just not good <laughs> okay i had to move you because you were like way too close to me all right let's get into it uh, i went in this with absolutely zero expectations and unfortunately for me that wasn't low enough while the prose itself was good rebecca can string a sentence together she can certainly write it's that her execution of literally every single thing was so subpar i'm very confused as to how this was published i think it's possible that this is another case where somebody's online presence precedes them and gets them 
opportunities that otherwise their craft would not have lent them on its own, which is getting to be a real problem lately. Uh, another problem I think this book has, and I'm not trying to be mean here, is that certain other authors hyped it up. It seems like there is a very supportive circle of YA authors who are all friends with each other and read each other's work, and I'm happy for them. I'm happy that they found friendship in each other. I'm happy that they all love their work, both their own and each other's. The problem is that using each other to market your own books, I feel like they're all sort of seeing each other through rose-colored glasses. As I said, Chloe Gong blurbed this book, and I have, oh, I hate to say, like, I'm not trying to shit on her as a person. It's just that her writing, I don't think is good. In fact, some of the same issues I had that led me to DNFing Chloe Gong's book, These Violent Delights, are issues that I had in Rebecca's book. And had I not been reading this for this, did it deserve one star, I would have DNF'd this. I didn't have any interest in reading it in the first place. I'm only here because it <laughs> is uh, eligible for the series that I do. The way that information is given in both books, in the beginning in particular, is done so poorly, just dumping all this info in your lap that you are going to inevitably forget, and specifically dumping it in narration rather than allowing it to come up in conversation, which I think is the better way to build your characters and your world because it lends itself to giving your characters their own voices and you get to know them and the world at the same time. So I did finish it. Let's just let's go through my notes. So we're in a fantasy world where there are uh, several different pieces at play here. Everyone is born human, but then in some people, predominantly girls, but sometimes boys and non-binary folks. But I say that with a caveat. If you're going into this book thinking, yay, non-binary rep, there's only like one person who's non-binary on the page and it's pretty short-lived. So it's not like it's a regular <laughs> occurring, you know, a scene with a, an, an NB person. It's just, it's just a tiny little smidge of the book. So witchery will manifest in a human and then that now witch will go to live with one of the four covens. So it's not like people are born witch or born human. Everybody is lumped together unless witchery manifests. Unfortunately, I don't really understand the dynamics very well because they were not done very well. There are allegedly different kinds of magic. I don't remember seeing anything on page except Ranka's blood magic. So what other kinds of witches are there? Could Beats me. I read the whole book and I couldn't tell you. Uh, I don't recall them at all. Um, and unfortunately, that is a common struggle that this book has is a lot of things happening off page. There are instances upon instances of important players being a part of this book and never actually showing up in the book. They're just kind of talked about. This is a story where the center Central conflict is not just the what I will be calling um, it, it's a it's a plague but I will be calling it zombie witch plague um, the central conflict is that the zombie witch plague came about because there is a power struggle so we have several groups doing this so here they are in no particular order one the four clans of witches collectively and separately all want more power uh, to the monarchs the uh, Sunra twins Aramis and Galen who are in power but are not really interested in power, don't really know how their kingdom runs, aren't really a part of that, their parents are dead and they're just sort of like filling a seat for now. Uh, Aramis the uh, princess was named ineligible for being the queen because they were hoping she would be born a witch. She wasn't and uh, her brother Galen was born with skybreaker powers, basically like weather magic, which all of his predecessors, his grandfather and his father had, and so he he was deemed eligible to rule. Three, the Hands of Solome, which is sort of like a religious cult organization who treats the witches pretty poorly. They treat the witches like shit. They want to take over and put the Sooner twins out of power. And they're appealing to like, the Hands of Solome are appealing to like the working class, the common people, by scapegoating the witches. And then and finally, for the rich elite class council members who literally never appear on page and are never described. Oh, except for one paragraph at the end where they're like, what? Aramis can't be queen. Galen's supposed to be king. And they're like, well, Aramis is going to be queen. And then they just go away. That's it. That's all we see of the council members. Oh my god. Who, a developmental editor for this, who did this? So they say one line, they're never described. And um, so anyone who isn't of high class has pretty low representation 
representation and that is like the central issue here. All right, we open our main character, Renka, who is a blood witch, which is rare. <laughs> um, I, again, don't know what other kind of witches there are because the magic outside of blood witchery never really shows up. Blood witch sounds like it does stuff with blood. It doesn't. It's that the magic lives in her blood and causes her to have like changes within her body that lead her to be violent and want to um, cause death, kill people. So when the magic comes out, she starts to see the world in like shades of gray. She slips into this place where she can't like feel pain um, or she doesn't really feel a level of fear. She just wants to do violence. And the thing about blood witchery is that it shortens your life. And the queen, Aramis's mom, and her, Aramis, the princess, uh, noted that blood witches don't live very long. They don't like live into old age. So they were previously trying to off page, of course, <laughs> do some testing to figure out like if blood witchery could be stopped. Anyway, so Renka is a violence witch. Aramis's mother was a blood witch, a violence witch. Aramis's grandma was a violent violence witch. So they were the blood winds and now Renka is going to be the blood wind, which means she has to marry Galen. So she lives in the north. She's attacked by another witch who she thinks upon seeing is another blood witch, but then the witch attacks her and it's actually like a weird plagued zombie witch. So she goes back to her coven, the Sikra. The leader of the coven, Ongram, says, oh hey, by the way, me and Yeva, who allegedly Renka thinks of as a sister, uh, went out scouting and we were attacked by humans. We got separated. I haven't seen her since. Ongram's like, they probably assumed that Yeva was Renka, who's supposed to go south to marry Galen, the prince. Uh, they must have abducted her to do the treaty. And it's like, huh? The way this information was dumped on us here was ridiculous because you have no context. It's it's like basically all done via narration. So none of it sinks in. Here, I'll read it to you. I only have a few days left until this arc expires. Ah! <laughs> My note says, bruh, I'm only 20 pages in. Stop it. A question seems to rise from the 60 hearts beating around her. Would she fail them or would she fight? I'm tired, she wanted to say. I've spent my whole life fighting. I've had enough. Renka's hand drifted to her bracelet. Had it been anyone else, she would have turned away, but all Renka could see was Yeva. Yeva washing Renka's wounds after Bel Ren, teaching her to sue. Sue? So. Good lord, Rachel. Sneaking her meals when Ongram cut her rations. Calming her when Renka woke screaming in the night for a sister who was never coming back. Yeva, always gentle, always kind, long after Renka no longer deserved it. 20 pages in. I had no context for any of that. The way that you're feeling right now about me reading that, having barely any context, not understanding what the fuck is going on, is exactly the way that I felt while reading it. Went right over your head, right? Not a good execution of story. <laughs> Bad story building. Bad, Rebecca. Okay, let me describe the treaty for you, since I had to figure it out along the way. There is a treaty set up by the old monarch, the Sooner Twins' grandfather. So the twins, Aramis and Galen, and Sunra, their grandfather set it up and suppose it's supposed to make it so that there's like equal representation, right? So a blood witch, which is like the most powerful kind of witch, has to marry a Sunra heir. So this generation's heir is Galen, the blood witch, the blood wind. I don't know why it's called blood wind, is our main character Ranka. And the people had been hoping that um, being the daughter of a blood witch again, that Aramis would be a blood witch as well. No dice. She has no magic. She's deemed unfit to rule. Her brother Galen has the skybreaker magic, but he only can tap into like his wind powers and that's a problem. So people are struggling because he can't seem to get his magic to work to help the land. There's a drought, blah, blah, blah. He do weather stuff. So that's the treaty. But Renka before the events of this book was like, nah, I don't want to do that. Chose not to head to the capital called Sea Swept uh, to be the blood wind and engage in the treaty. So Ongram, the covenly leader says to her, hold on, let me get it again. You chose as Bloodwind to deny the treaty and deny the coup. I respected that. I stood down, even with freedom within our grasp. But now one of our own has been taken. If you want this fight, I will not stand in your way. If you want the prince's blood, it is yours to spill. Every witch here would be honored to fight with you. And Rank is like, but it would be like war if I killed the prince. And Elgrim's like, war among the humans? There are no other male heirs. His sister was deemed unfit to rule. Kill the boy, the humans turn on one another in their scramble for power, and Witchick, the land delegated relegated to what the land allotted to the witches will be free coven's like yay and i'm like well that's suspicious <laughs> um i'm gonna stop you there rebecca i'm gonna stop you there 
because listen another part of this book that Rebecca had trouble <sighs> Rebecca does not know how to write a story in which the information is given at the right time again the synopsis was too much I shouldn't even have read it before reading the book honestly because the synopsis and the way that Rebecca gives information makes things so blatantly obvious to the reader and since I know that the princess is the love interest via the synopsis and the prince is described in the synopsis as being quote gentle and kind so that little speech that Ongram just gave 20 pages into this book made no fucking sense and I actually put in my Goodreads updates at this point that I was already convinced that it was Ongram who set this whole shit up since she was the last person to see Yeva and putting two and two together I was like the only answer is that Ongram's the bad guy here I knew 20 25 pages in and I held out hope that Rebecca was like maybe doing something super slick and just like making me come to that conclusion early so that I would have to like fight against it the whole book no nope that is exactly what happened Ongram doesn't show up again until 75% through the book and sure enough she's the bad guy she did all of this she's the big bad this book has such a problem with being heavy-handed in every possible way and this was only the first I really I don't understand how did a developmental editor pass this through and say yep good to go I don't get it I was able to predict every single thing that would happen before it happened from like big reveals to minute character interactions I knew before it happened so she goes to the capital sea swept where the palace is where the Sooner twins live and she's there under the guise that she will take part in the treaty but really Ongram sent her there to kill the prince and start a coup so that the humans would fight amongst each other and Wichick would be free the plan is so bad it's just not good um, and allegedly Reka doesn't care about any of this she's only going because she thinks that Yeva was taken to the capital but of course um, she forgets about Yeva for considerable chunks of time so yeah and we already know from the synopsis that murdering the prince is going to be a no-go because he's described as kind and gentle and his sister is the love interest so there's just no way that she's going to kill the prince obviously all right so she gets to the capital and there she meets this has a pretty small cast of characters to be honest she meets the sooner twins percy the ambassador from the star isles or something and captain foldry wolf who is the captain of the guard and described as pale and lean with a shock of red hair and i'm so sorry but all i could think of was that part where Malfoy is like must be a Weasley. I also have to complain about the word pale being used actually because I said this about Lightbringer by Claire Legrand too. I couldn't help but notice how often the word pale was used and I'm like do y'all know synonyms? It was getting thrown around constantly. Like my god Rebecca and Claire use a synonym. Call them paper colored. Call them glue colored for all I care. Just call them something other than pale. Stop using the same word over and over because if I'm pointing out pointing it out then I'm getting taken out of the story to think about the fact that y'all can't can't think of a word to describe something other than pale. Just say they're they're the color of milk. Like just say something. Some variety please for the love of God. If I'm picking up on a word being used this much it's too much so find a synonym. Like the captain of the guard pale. Percy from the whatever island pale. One of the hands of Solomay that they're about to meet pale. Everybody's pale. Say something else. My god white as a sheet. Like just say something. Okay so she meets the princess and the prince and right off the bat it is hammered over your head. How nice Prince Galen is. Wow he's so much nicer than the coven believes. Like okay I get it. It was already said in the synopsis you don't need to beat me over the head with it. But like the Sooner twins didn't really needed to be hated by the coven anyway since they're not really in charge. So I still don't understand that choice. Uh, Renka doesn't really interact with them much at first. They don't really trust her. She doesn't trust them. They're all strangers and then one day Renka decides to be sneaky and follows Princess Aramis and Percy the ambassador for the whatever island. She p follows Ambassador Percy and Aramis into the mines below the castle and there's this body of this dead witch this zombie witch who had the same issues that the other witch at the beginning had and these in the book are called Winolin witches I won't be calling them that they're zombie witches to me moving on uh Percy and Aramis are discussing the zombie witch when in walks a bunch of the hands of Solome the religious organization and the, and there's this guy the pale guy who's like you witch loving Sunras and you ambassador Percy you're the worst we think you're responsible 
responsible for the zombie witches. You're coming with us and we want the zombie witch's dead body too. They're all about to fight. Ranka runs out with a knife, like uh, goes into like her blood witch mode. She holds a knife to the pale man's throat and is like, somebody better start giving me answers. No one's talking. She kills the pale guy. And then this other lady who's a hand of Salome is like adamant that she not give Ranka any answers and stabs herself. <laughs> and uh, Percy and Aramis get away. Aramis and Ranka have a little chat where Aramis is like, I don't trust you and I kind of want you to leave. But they agree that Ranka's blood magic is getting worse. And she's like, my mom dealt with that. And we were trying to make things better for her. Um, we were trying to do some sciencey shit about blood magic. And she's like, I'll help you with yours if you know, and, and they make like some kind of deal where uh, she's like also teaching Ranka to learn to read, but that never happens on page. I don't really understand their agreement, to be honest. And then she also helps them with the whole zombie witch thing. Ranka wants to help more. And she's like, let me in, like, let me help. And Aramis is like, nah, I, I don't trust you. In fact, uh, I don't like you. And she says, <laughs> I hate you. Not because you're a witch though, because you're a miserable, lonely, selfish girl and you're a liar. Okay, like I get the lying thing, but you're gonna hate somebody for being lonely? That's fucking weird. But also they're flirting on and off. <laughs> But it's really weird in the text because it's all done by narration. So like in the middle of them fighting, all of a sudden the narration will be like Ranka's inner thoughts and she'll be like, wow, she really is beautiful though. You're like, okay. It's so heavy handed and awkward. And again, you're experiencing it through this narration that I don't know how to describe this to you other than it feels like it's switching between first and third, even though it's technically not doing that. Like the, the, the narration being like relied on so heavily was a real problem for me. Um, I would end a chapter and start a new one and I would forget just turning the page that we were in third and not in first. So I'd start and I'd be like, is this in third now? So I'd go back and I'd be like, wait, it wasn't in first that whole time? It was very confusing. <laughs> it was very weird. It was one of, the, one of the weirdest reading experiences I've ever had. Another thing that I would forget <laughs> what tense we're in is um, people, actual characters and plot points because they rarely would show up. Uh, so for instance, she brings up in narration that Ranka has to slide a knife through Galen's ribs and kill him. And I was like, hold up. I forgot that she even has to murder the guy because we've been dealing with zombie witches for so many chapters. I forgot that that was even a thing that was happening. Holy shit. Took an entire backseat in the back of a fucking van. Took a backseat like in a different car. That's how long ago it is since the last time we brought up her having to kill the guy. Another thing that takes a backseat is the captain of the guard, Foldry Wolf. <laughs> All of a sudden she gets called into his office and I was like, who? Who is this again? Oh, right, the Weasley. So he's like, hey, listen, I love the Sunra twins. Like they're my own kids and I'd actually like you to leave for their safety. <laughs> and this was so fucking heavy handed, the conversation, the way that it was like, and it looked like he was hiding things. Um, It made me obvious that Foldry was more in charge than the twins were and that he was like making plans without them being involved. And I was like, well, he's another antagonist for sure then. More on that later because I was right. Uh, another thing that takes backseat throughout the book is Yeva. Ranka thinking about Yeva. Uh, Yeva is not a character. Yeva is a convenience that existed so that Rebecca could make things happen at her convenience. I can't tell you more than two things about Yeva. And by the end of the story, Yeva was long forgotten. Just not good. And she was forgotten because Galen and Renka go into town for a parade and Galen is only allowed by the powers that be to go into certain parts of town. And Renka is like, hey, my blood witchery is telling me something's up. Let's go investigate. Let's dip. My spidey senses are tingling. And so they scurry away and go into the parts of town that Galen's not allowed to be in. And they find a shit ton of mutilated bodies. And then they find a fucking witch zombie. That zombie witch is Yeva. Renka can't kill her because she loves her, but she like protects Galen from getting killed. And and Yeva gets killed, I think, by the guards. And of course, because she was just a device, Renka gets over it pretty fucking quickly. And this is another problem in the book is that where emotion should be, it's not. So by the time it does show up, it's so heavy handed and inorganic. Because of the zombie witches, there's sort of this power vacuum and the hands of Solome step in and they're like, we want to protect the common people. So the common people start joining the hands of Solome. So they're in town at one point, Renka and 
and crew again investigating um, and there's a girl I think she was like 14 and her witchery had just manifested and they're about to burn her alive the hands of soul are there the common people are there even the girl's mom is not sticking up for her and the weirdness of Franca's emotions at this point is so it's just so odd where she should have been outraged she wasn't and she was like well we gotta go we gotta go we gotta get Aramis out of here we gotta protect her and then all of a sudden by the time she was like oh no they're gonna burn this girl alive it was way too late for it to feel authentic because the the way that the series of events transpired was just so odd and felt almost inhuman like it felt like a robot wrote this and Ranga ends up throwing a knife at the young witch's heart to put her out of her misery and it should have been emotional but instead it was just weird and it's because purely because of the way that Rebecca writes they end up chasing down some more zombie witches they're trying to create a cure using Ranka's blood it starts to feel like <laughs> <laughs> they catch one and they have they have her in like a coma it kind of feels like that part from I am legend at one point point. and one of the zombie witches who's alive stabs Captain Foldry and then there's like an explosion they think he's dead but guess what as the prophet Taylor Swift said no body no crime Foldry was suspicious as fuck and Rebecca is way too heavy-handed for it to be anything else and guess what Foldry comes back alive towards the end and he's been in charge of a faction of the hands of Solome the whole time a faction not the whole thing they are split up. Who could have guessed he was an antagonist? It turns out he wants to put himself in power because he's seen that the the Sunra family is just like not doing a good job and he's like I love the twins but their father was bad at ruling so I just want to ship them off somewhere safe and be in charge because I think I can do a better job. And the other faction of the Hands of Solome turns out surprising to some definitely but definitely not me. Uh, they've been working with dun da 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 Ongra, remember her? Yeah, probably not because um, she barely shows up in this book. <laughs> The leader of the Sikra Coven, Ranka's Coven, Ongram, that one, that Ongram. And I knew it. I knew it 20 pages in. Ongram orchestrated the whole thing, got Yeva sent to the capital, has been making the zombie witches all in a terribly planned effort to get herself in power. So first she somehow convinces Ranka that the twins have been playing her the whole time for like 10 pages. And then Ranka is like, oopsie doopsie, Ongram's been lying to me. She's gonna kill Galen. We must save him. We must rally the people that I just betrayed like four pages ago. They go fight the witches. They save Galen. He uses his skybreaker powers, which have manifested fully. She starts to fight Ongram. Ongram injects herself with zombie witch stuff and her and Ranka fight and then they fall off a cliff. Ongram doesn't survive. Ranka does. And in the end, Aramis forgives her for betraying her. They all make a treaty <laughs> that works for everybody, which they could have just made from the beginning. And it puts more of the humans who are not of like upper class in power. The common people, you know, they get more seats in power and uh, everyone's got an equal say. More witches get a say. The blood wind no longer has to marry a Sunra heir. Aramis ends up queen because Galen never wanted to be king. Aramis and Ranka end up together. Percy and Galen end up literally sailing into the sunset together. So why did I give this two stars? <laughs> the structure of this did not make any sense to me. All of the things that are supposed to be like formative to who Ranka was, which I haven't even really mentioned here because they're meaningless to me. They were either barely shown or shown way too late for them to make an impact on the reader. And even when they were shown, Rebecca's writing doesn't really allow for emotions to be shown. Rebecca is so stuck on using her own narrative voice to tell the story rather than allowing her characters to speak for themselves. This caused me to have such a poor reading experience because her narrative voice is boring. Every single thing that was supposed to land an emotional impact just left me rolling my eyes and saying, okay, but you didn't make this case early enough for this to land. This was definitely the case for Ongram, who allegedly was ranked his mother figure but we never really saw any scenes of that. It was also the case for Yeva who was allegedly Branka's stand-in sister. We barely saw Yeva and then she dropped off the face of the earth. It was also the case for <laughs> Ranka's actual sister whose name I don't remember because she's basically irrelevant. Ranka's backstory is hinted at throughout the text in narration so that you understand she burned down a town, killed a bunch of people, but by the time the story is actually told it does not land an impact because you already knew what happened and all that was left was for Rebecca to narrate some more rather than for allowing
allowing organic conversations and feelings to flow and have the reader experience what the characters were experiencing in their own words. Even if there weren't controversy surrounding this book and its author, and even if I had been interested in this book beforehand, all of this, this reading experience, would lead me to believe that Rebecca is simply not skilled enough as a writer yet, not enough to have a published work, and I wouldn't read any more of her work after this. Because everything that is supposed to make an emotional impact and be a takeaway from the book, it didn't land. Again, I don't know any of these characters' voices. All I know is Rebecca's narration, which I am overly familiar with and underwhelmed by. I'm sure Rebecca really loves these characters and feels that the themes and the story were important, but that's not enough and she did not cultivate this story in a way that makes her characters real for the reader or lends itself to any conversation on any important theme. And I'm honestly really surprised that this got published as is and I don't know that it would have had Rebecca not had an online presence. And it's a shame because she had little seeds of good ideas, like I love death magic, I love that idea. It's not necromancy, it's just death magic, which is another favorite of mine. Necromancy is definitely top tier. And I like the idea of how Percy, which I didn't really bring up because it, it barely comes up, but Percy is sort of like a dragon personified. He doesn't turn to a dragon, but he has some scales and he breathes fire. That's cool. And I like at the at the end the idea that Ranka was going into therapy, but again this was narrated to us and we never saw it on page. Seeing on page therapy in a fantasy would be so cool. We could have explored that more. We could have explored Percy's magic more. I don't understand why any of this couldn't have been done better. But then again, seeing as how we did explore Ranka's death magic and Rebecca didn't do a good job at that, I have very little hope for how she would do well regarding any other ghoul factor she could have brought into the story. And because of all this, it was just so disappointing and that's why I gave it two stars. From a craft standpoint, this is just not a good book. I guess I could also mention that the romance felt really weird. Again, this was another thing that was narrated to us rather than experienced by us because Rebecca tells you she doesn't allow the characters to speak for themselves. So I felt like we were more seeing how Rebecca felt about the romance than how the characters felt about each other. Except when we would switch to like, oh, we're in the middle of a conversation where they're not getting along and Rank is like, wow, she's so beautiful. And it's like, okay, that's cool, I guess. That's not actually a substitute for writing and cultivating romantic feelings between two characters though. So that's why I gave two stars. It was predictable, it was underdone, it was overly narrated. You never get to explore characters' perspectives. Rebecca does not know how to write a voice other than her own. It's extremely sloppy execution. And I'm honestly pretty disappointed it got published as is because I think that given more time and more work with an ed with a developmental editor, this could have been a better book. I don't know for me that it, it would ever go beyond like three and a half stars, but it's so poorly executed I, I can't give it more than two. So that's it. That was a really disappointing book I read. Again, go watch Marty's TikToks down below to hear about the controversy really all I have to say about this one. Uh, so that's it. Thanks for watching. Leave your comments and questions down below. Like and subscribe. Check out my Patreon and I will see you next time. Bye!